Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. His name is Greg D., and I sponsor other men, and um, yet again, an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, I believe we're on top of page 20. Am I correct? And give me a thumbs up if anyone sees me. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the rich, the richness of my life is not reading the big book. I, richness of my life is when I read the big book out loud to somebody. I make this book come alive and take statements and turn them into questions and, you know, personalize it to me. Um, my experience validates this book. And uh, there is a solution has a warm place in my heart. Um, I was crazy. <laughs> I came in, right? I was outright mental defective when I was in my sixth rehab. I was hopeless, suicidal, broken all that stuff. And I was reading the 12 and 12 and, you know, the 12 and 12 is fantastic. Beautiful piece of literature. Uh, The thing I loved about it the most was that it had no instructions in it. You know, I got ADD. I got alcohol defiance disorder. (laughs) You tell me to do something, I do the opposite. Um, the problem with no instructions is that they, there's no promises. So I didn't, I didn't, have, I didn't experience any promises in the in the twelve and twelve because there was nothing in there. I wasn't going through the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous, and when I opened up this book, it said there is a solution. The first page I literally opened up. We don't have an answer. We have a solution. Major difference. Right. And I'm like, there's hope for me. And if anyone's new here, welcome. We have a way out. We have a way up and a way out. You're not going to like it, though. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. And right. I resisted everything in this program until I got my ass thoroughly whooped. Pain is the touchstone for growth. Oh, yeah. And then I finally accepted the plan outlined in this book, and I was sold on the ideas contained in this book. My life started to change. So, you know, it's funny. There's there's four stages of recovery in, in the doctor's opinion. Um, it's in Hank Parker's story and also in Fitz Mayo's story. And the four stages are is both of them have no hope. They're hopeless, meaning that I can't stay stopped. The second stage of recovery is elimination of alcohol. And the third stage for both of them was accept the plan outlined in this book. And the other one was being sold on the ideas contained in this book. And the fourth stage is a recovered state, meaning that we're brimming over with self-reliance and contentment after we've done the steps. And we've made this a way of life. The 12 and 12 talks about on page 15 that, uh, this is a group of principles, spiritual in nature. If practiced as a way of life, can expel the, the obsession to drink and make that person whole again. And that was my experience going through this treasure map. So on page 20, <clears throat> top of the page, it says, you may already be asking yourself, why is it that all of us became so very ill from drinking? Was I, did I become very ill from drinking? Yes. Absolutely. I was literally, <laughs> I mean, I was, I was walking around so tired, so tired. And then I died. And then I woke up with a new attitude. Right. It all had to start somewhere. It started with no hope. And then it said, doubtless, you were curious to discover how and why in the face of expert opinion. Right. To the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. That is clear cut, um, 
an explanation of what I've recovered from, right? A lot of people get, uh, you know, into little fist fights about, <laughs> am I recovering? Am I recovered? Recovered's past tense. Our title page, if you ever want to go to your title page, not many people know this, but on the title page right here, it says Alcoholics Anonymous. And then right below that is called a subtitle. And what I was taught, well, my friend taught me this, and a librarian taught my friend this. And it says, it's a story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. That is also a promise and a hope. So we've seen this word recovered right in the title. So a subtitle is part of the title of the book. So I can't argue the title of the book. <laughs> and what did I recover from? And I, clubber, I recovered from definable symptoms, right? The allergy. I no longer put alcohol in my system, right? That triggers this allergy. An allergy in the 1930s definition-wise means an abnormal reaction to food, beverage, or substance. So whenever I drink, I get thirstier. I want more. <laughs> Basically, become an off, a machine without an off button, right? And what is this mind, right? It means that I can't, my mind will take me to that first drink no matter what. The obsession. I have recovered from both of those states. If you are an alcoholic, that's a question. Am I an alcoholic? Put some skin in the game. Make this book come alive to you. Who wants to get over it? Do I want to get over it? Yeah. You may be already be asking, uh, what do I have to do? So they spend a lot of time in the, you know, page 17 to page 20 talking about a little bit of the solution. Now they're going to introduce us to the problem. Right? They talk about that on the solution uh, on the first page, page 17. One of my favorite pages, obviously I talked about a little bit earlier, but I'm standing on this foundation today and it says one element is powerful cement. Cement has two parts. Cement has two parts. And we're going to introduce the first part of the problem in the, in the next couple of pages that I'm going to read. That's our problem, our common peril. The second part, is uh, a common solution, which is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So you have this two parts of the cement, which is a problem, and also the, the lowercase fellowship with the common solution. And I'm still standing on this foundation today. It is an unsinkable foundation. It's an unshakable foundation. And I am, my life is uh, beyond my wildest dreams today. Because I set that up. But how do I understand the solution if I don't understand the problem? And we are going to go heavy into it in the next three pages. And we are still talking about the body. The disease of the body. Right? And then on page 23, 23 to 43, we will be talking about the mind. Right? Okay. It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. We shall tell you what we have done. So what did I do? First step was an admission. I admitted that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life was unmanageable. How is my life unmanageable? Go to page 52. We have the bedevilments right here. Middle of the page, we had to ask ourselves, and it says, I was having trouble with personal relationships. Oh, yeah. <laughs> On my own power, was I able to fix these personal relationships? No, I could not manage that. I couldn't, I couldn't control my emotional natures. <laughs> I could not control my emotional natures. On my own power, was I able to manage my emotional natures? No, I could not manage that. I was a prey to misery and depression. You ever been a prey? You ever been pounced on by misery and depression? Oh, yeah. On my own power, was I able to have misery and depression go away? No. I could not manage that. I couldn't make a living. One of my favorite lines in the book, 
And I was, ta- I was, t- you know, like I said, it took that statement, turned into a question. Terry, you couldn't make a living? Oh, yeah, I'm broke as a joke. <laughs> There's no, that's an easy yes. After studying this book a little bit further, it means I'm not comfortable living in my own skin. Could you make a living on your own power? Absolutely not. Had a feeling of uselessness. Oh, yeah. On my own power, was I able to have uselessness go away? No. I could not manage that. Was I full of fear? I was, like, full of terror. (laughs) I was, like, shaking. I had, like, restless leg syndrome at one point. Couldn't stop scratching my face off or chawing my fingernails to the bone. On my own power, was I able to have my fears go away? No. I could not manage that. Was I unhappy? Absolutely, I was unhappy. On my own power, was I able to have happiness come back into my life? No. Couldn't be a a real help to other people. On my own power, was I able to be a real help to other people? No, I could not manage that life. I lack power, guys. I need power in my life. This book is all about building a relationship with a power that will help you at certain times when you do not have a defense against the first trait. Step two is a consideration. Am I willing to believe or do I believe in a power greater than myself? I was asked that really simple question. Do I believe is for the agnostic? Am I willing to believe is for the atheist? And when I asked, do I believe? I said, back up, bro. No, <laughs> no way. But I'm willing to believe. <laughs> you know, my, I just want to give a shout out to that alcohol. The great persuader beat the shit out of me. Beat the piss out of me. To the point where it's like, I, I'm willing to believe. And my sponsor said, you're on your way, Terry. Because I lack power. I lost power, choice, and control over a drink. I could not stay stuck. Step three is a, is a decision. What did I decide to do? Well, God was going to be my director, principal, and father. I was going to be his child, agent, and actor. I did not do any of it <laughs> when I read the third step prayer. And that's an affirmation and the confirmation of our decision. The actual decision is on page 62. I read this book like a romance novel. <laughs> it's not a romance novel. Definition of a romance novel? I have it somewhere. Hold on. I think it's a, a, a piece of fiction, or a piece of fiction, something like that. Ah, I'll find it later. This is a basic text, meaning that it's a textbook. There's instructions that are meant to be followed through. If I go to Ikea and I, have a, I need a, a coffee table because I have a party coming in the next day, You know, damn well, I'm going to follow every instruction on that pamphlet to make sure my coffee table looks pristine. (laughs) I'm not going to miss one instruction where it has three legs. I'm going to follow it. And a nice invisible line under that third step prayer, it says, we thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready to at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. Those are some strong words. I did not do that. I did not do that. I was nine months sober, and it felt like calamity in my mind. felt like I was going to die. Oh, I was just looking for a job, and I didn't find the right one. That's what happened. <laughs> but it felt like the end of the world. And I called my sponsor. He's like, did you pray about it? I'm like, no, I didn't pray about it. I called you. You're the guru. You're the man. Tell me what to do. So you just need to pray about it, Terry. And I got off the phone. I was like, that. Bastard told me to pray about <laughs> Guys, there's immense pain right before a real surrender. Not the wish washing one. I'm talking about the real deal. You know, back in the 30s, you weren't even allowed to go into a meeting unless you admitted you were an alcoholic in front of other people and got on your knees and abandoned yourself utterly to God in front of other people. And you have three or four people looking saying, invalidate, yeah, that was a real surrender. No, that wasn't. You can't come in. That's what they did back then. Then you could go into the meeting. And that pain, that pain was immense. 
And I got down on my knees and I said, God, I offer myself to you. Take me. Here I am. I am yours. Do whatever you want with me. Release me of this bondage of self. So I may better do your will. And I had an answer prayer. I had no idea that God had a 24-7 hotline that I could just touch base with any time. I had no idea. It says it on bottom page 58, remember we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power, all power. Circle that word all. And that one is your sponsor. You should call him out. <laughs> I'll let that one sit. It does not say that. It says, there is one who has all power. That one's Finney. You should call her now. No, it does not say that. There is one who has all power. That one's Jessica. You should call her now. No, it does not say that. It says, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. A lot of people don't understand. That's an instruction. We read that that line every day in, in meetings. Right now. That's a time frame. God is everything. God is a great reality. God is right now. Call him. When I finally made that decision afterwards that God was going to be my director, I was going to be his actor. He was a principal. I was his agent. He is a father, and I'm his child. Remarkable things started to happen, guys. Remarkable things started to happen. I had a higher power before. Now I have the highest power in my life. That's if I kept close to him, performed his work well. And how do I perform his, perform his work well? It's having a servant's heart. We agnostic says God doesn't make too hard, too hard terms with those who seek him. Those are the terms. Tells us to become power seekers. I'm actually convinced that God rigorously seeks us all the time. All the time. He sends us messages and messengers all the time. Am I awake to listen to hear them? or see them, or experience them. Step four through nine are the action steps that I take to get unblocked, to allow this power in. And 10, 11, 12 are the discipline steps. You know, I had no idea what I was doing with this work. I was just doing it because my ass was on fire. I did not want to drink again. And all of a sudden, I started to realize that my life started to change. I had a, I, I was a, a, I was riding high on this fifth step that I had because the drink was, obsession was lifted during the fifth step. And then when I got to step nine, I balked. I was even telling people I was on steps nine, ten, eleven, twelve, but I wasn't doing it. And the obsession came back. And I was literally out of traffic light looking to make a left to go to the bar or make a right to go to a meeting. That's where I was. I called up my sponsor. He's like, did you make your amends? I'm like, no, I didn't make my amends. I called you. (laughs) You're the guy. He's like, maybe you just need to make your amends. And like I said, there's a lot of pain. I got ADD, alcoholic defiance disorder. I'm not going to do jack shit unless I got pain associated with it. We're talking about a new freedom and a new happiness. I was still walking around asleep, dreaming my ass was awake. Right? And I called one of my friends, and he was an enemy of my mind. And uh, um, I was just looking at my phone for like 45 minutes, just shaking, just shaking, trembling, just like Dr. Bob when he made his amends. And I was asking for the willingness to call him and also telling myself I'm willing to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. I was just literally repeating that to myself for 45 minutes. And then I called him up and he picked up the phone and he said, hey, Terry, where have you been? I love you. I miss you. <laughs> I had no idea that people had love and compassion for me. Right then and there, I was rocking right into the fourth dimension of existence. Found out the two most important dates of my life. It's not my sobriety date. It was the day I was born, the day I found out why, and the day I found out why I fit myself 
to be a maximum service to God and the people around me. Oh, let's rock and roll with the men's now. <laughs> this was the juice. This was the good stuff. It took me three months to knock out my amends in one week. Jessica, three months of not doing shit. <laughs> and one week to knock it out. Still doing the financial part. And I started to notice two weeks later that I wasn't thinking about drinking. I wasn't even dreaming about it anymore. God did for me what I could not do for myself. That's what I've done. I took the steps. And I practice the disciplines 10 and 11 every single day. I personally love to put, take a line out of the 10th step or the 11th step. This is beautiful stuff. This is fun stuff. Because step 10 and 11 are like an abyss. I mean, they just go on and on and on. Step 10 is like one paragraph, but you could go forever. And then. Take out a, a discipline saying to watch for your defects of character all through the day. Become a watcher. Put that on a note card. Right, And then write your experience on the back while you practice this discipline all day. Try practicing the discipline of turning your thoughts to someone I can help. Ah, what about those other alcoholics? Ah, what about my other coworkers? Ah, what about my other family members? Ah, what about my friends? I promise you won't be thinking about yourself. <laughs> This is, the, this is what reduces me and more God. The step 10 is all about beating down me and then more God, right? And step 12, and, and I do a ton of work with guys. I'm working with three new guys right now. Uh, one guy is just, is just giving the instructions to step four, but this is what I've been doing. It says nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking than intensive work with other alcoholics. I get immunity from drinking. When I help others, just like I said in the beginning of this of, the, uh, of this meeting, right? I could I I could read the big book out loud. I'm um, sorry to myself all day, but if when I read it out loud to another man, this book comes alive. I start to make this book a way of life, a design for living. I start to live the words in the book. I start to live in the fourth dimension. I start to live in the world of the spirit. I start to live in the realm of the spirit. I start to live in the spirit of the universe. This shit's real. A lot of people don't like, you know, a lot of people forget about those chapters, two wives, two employers, a family afterwards. Those are important chapters, guys. 75 pages dedicated to step 12, 89 and 164. Study them, read them, make them a way of life. We already read it. Yeah, I think the last time you guys were here on page 19, it says a much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. Later, Anthony, love you, bro. They're in that order for a reason. If I'm not demonstrating these principles, which is our steps, at home, I'm not going to have a home. If I'm not demonstrating these principles at work, I'm not going to have a job. If I'm not demonstrating these principles in all my affairs, I'm going to be colliding with you. You're going to retaliate. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to become indignant. And I'm going to go into self-pity. And I'm going to think drink solution, drink answer. It's imperative. It says... Before we go into a detailed discussion, which I just did, <laughs> it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times have people said to us, can I take it or leave it alone? Can I take alcohol and leave it alone? That's a statement turned into a question. Absolutely not. What we're looking here now, guys, is am I an alcoholic Am I an, or am I an addict or am I both or am I neither? Why are we looking at this? Because it is it, it is important importance, right? If I'm helping someone who is an, an addict, <clears throat> why would they want anything I have if I don't share the same problem with them? Right? Or if I'm trying to help a, a non-alcoholic, why would they want anything I have if I don't share the same problem? Same thing. Am I an alcoholic? Am I, or am I an addict? Or am I both? Or am I neither? I'm blessed to be both. 
had to do a lot of ass kicking to to realize that one. If anyone is suffering from both of those, let me know. But there's a purpose of why we have this uh, singleness purpose, because look at the Washingtonians; they had an answer for this pro. They had a, they almost had an answer for the for the liquor problem, and they allowed everyone into their their uh, movement. And also check this out: in in the 1800s, they had issues, outside issues, come in where they argued about slavery. Yeah, yeah, they fought each other. And they dissipated there, like 500,000 members, and they dissipated within months. Why is, I want AA to be around for my children and their children, AA. So singleness of purpose is critical. Am I an alcoholic, or am I an addict, or am I both, or am I neither? That's what we're trying to find out here. Why don't you drink like a gentleman? Can I drink like a gentleman and quit? Quit means saying, stay, stop. No, I cannot. That fellow can't handle his liquor. Can I handle my liquor? Take that statement, turn it into a question. Make this book come alive. Lay off the hard stuff. Can I lay off the hard stuff? His willpower must be weak. Is my willpower weak when it comes to alcohol? Yes. <laughs> He could stop if he wanted to. Could I stop if I wanted to? No. She's such a sweet girl. I, I should think he would stop for her sake, right? This is a lot of a, probably the emotional appeal in the doctor's opinion. Probably the emotional appeal seldom suffices, right? Like, Terry, I believe in you. You could do it. Terry, you're going to die if you keep drinking. <laughs> that shit didn't work, right? I needed to be approached by people who were armed with the facts. Right, meaning that they took the steps, and also they have the medical <clears throat> medical facts about themselves. <clears throat> Do they share the same problem I have? I think what Russell says you can't get out. Of, the first step of getting out of jail is knowing that you're in jail in the first place. Am I an alcoholic, or am I an addict, or am I both? This is what we're looking at. Uh, the leash, can you please mute? Or I'll meet you. I got the power. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> uh, the doctor told him if he ever drank again, it would kill him. The doctor told me that. I had open heart surgery in 2018. Five bypass open heart surgery because of drinking and drugging. They put a balloon pump in me to keep me alive. Actually, I had to learn how to breathe again because my lungs, they, they cut your lungs. I got to go pour little tubes here. And they cut my lungs and my golf, my lungs shrunk to golf ball sizes. I had to learn how to breathe. I had to learn how to sit up. I had to learn how to walk again. Terry, you're going to die if you keep doing this. Picked up right where I left off. Fear kept me sober for a little while. Fear is an unreliable higher power, guys, period. Self-knowledge is an unreliable higher power. People are unreliable higher power. Success is an unreliable higher power. Doesn't help us in those strange mental blank spots. The insanity before the first drink. Bill called it, definition of the insanity, time out of mind. I'm going to drink no matter what. That's why a first step experience is I go through this, this work once a year um, and I really make a huge point in step one um, because I smash that shit home. It's either do the work or drink again. That's what's going to happen. Do the work or you're going to get drunk again. I have to be constantly reminded that I have a mind, a cry, a, I have a mind of a chronic alcoholic and a body that will has an allergy that when I drink, I want more. I forget that I have that because life gets really good. And when, like I said, my richness comes when I speak, when I read this book out loud to somebody reading this brought me back. But there he is all lit up again. Now, these are common observations on drinkers, which we hear all the time. 
back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. All right, they're talking about normal people, earth people, people that don't are non-alcoholics. They just don't understand us. It's why we tell our stories in AA. All right. It's why we tell our stories in AA. So we're not different from other people, guys. We're different from other drinkers. I'm different from the moderate drinker. I'm different from the hard drinker. And I'll explain. Moderate drinkers have little trubbing and giving up liquor entirely if they have a good reason for it, right? Can I give up drinking if I have a good reason for it? Make that state, turn that statement, turn into a question. No. They could take it or leave it alone. Can I take it or leave it alone? No. Okay, that separates me from the moderate drinker. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to impair him physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. If, I like this word, if, if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, open heart surgery, falling in love, change of environment, trying to move Florida a thousand times, <laughs> or the warning of a doctor, just talked about that, becomes operative, right? Shows up. That's what that word means. This man could stop or moderate. Terry, you're going to die if you take another drink or drug again by a doctor. Am I able to stop or moderate if I have a sufficiently strong reason? Absolutely not. Have you tried to move, make a geographic change? And were you able to stop and moderate? Absolutely not. Although may he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention, a hard drinker can end up in detox. By the way, there's a lot of hard drinkers in AA. Am I an alcoholic or am I an addict or am I both or am I neither? I remember I was taking a guy through this work, taking him through the doctor's opinion. And he was neither. I had to qualify him. And I found out that he was neither. He was able to stop or moderate. His mind didn't push him to the first drink. He had sufficiently strong reason. Go enjoy life, man. <laughs> Do your thing. You have the power. I don't. I've lost power, choice, and control. I'm going to drink no matter what. It's going to happen. But what about the real alcoholic? What about the real alcoholic? What the hell is that? He may start off as a moderate drinker. It means I could take it or leave it alone. In my early in my stage, absolutely, I was able to do that. I was able to control and enjoy my drinking for 16 out of 20 years why I had such a bad bottom because <laughs> I thought I could control and regulate the situation. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of his drinking career, which basically becomes a full-time job, I began to lose all control of his, my liquor consumption once I start to drink. Question, do you lose all, not some control, all control once you drink and once, uh, once you put a drink in you, that's your qualifier. Yes, that separates me from other drinkers. Not different from other people, from other drinkers. Remember, we're still talking about the disease of the body. Now they go into a description. I would have to say this is the, probably the best description of an alcoholic. <clears throat> I'll take a sip real quick. How much time do I have? 15 minutes? I'm going too slow. <clears throat> All right. Here is a fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. Ask yourself, is this you? He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. Absolutely. He is the real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I was a really nice guy when I was sober. 
when I would drink, I was like a tornado warning through the lives of others, right? Tornado warning, evacuate, tornado warning, evacuate. Here comes Terry, get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> he has seldom mildly intoxicated me. He is always more or less insanely drunk. I like that, how they describe drunk. Insanely drunk, yeah. And it, it, <laughs> I am, I'm a sloppy guy. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world, yet let him drink for a day. He becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. That hooked me right when I read this book. That hook, that line hooked me when I was reading this part. That was me to the T. He has a positive genius for getting tight at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when an important decision must be made or an engagement kept me. He's often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. But in that respect, he's incredibly dishonest and selfish, right? What is the most selfish thing you could do is drink. We don't care about anyone else, right? Most of the time I'm lying about it, <laughs> right? I steal Finney's wallet and I help her look for it, right? And <laughs> I I know that she finds out I, I that that I didn't take it, and then I get ease and comfort. I'm now on the liquor line, and I got the booze in me, and I take the drink. Off to the races. He often possesses a special uh, ability, skills, and aptitudes. This was me, and has a promising career ahead of him. He uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family, then pulls the structure down on his head. And essentially, series of spree. Right. I had a very promising career. Today, I deliver pizzas. <laughs> and I'm like the happiest delivery boy you'll ever see. It was funny. When I was in Minnesota, I, and and by the way, it was like very strong in recovery over there. Like literally like every block had like a sober living out there. And there were millionaires driving school buses. And in recovery, I was like, what the fuck are they doing? Like, why are you driving school? You guys are millionaires. Because they tell us to get sober jobs when we get out. That did not make sense to me. My conception was work hard, work at a desk. That's how you're successful in life. That's who you are. That was a conception I had for a long time. I got from my parents. And today I see the I see the connection where it's not material things that make me happy. Right. You know, it's my way of life that makes me happy. I'm not going to think about how much, if I'm on my deathbed, I'm not going to be thinking about how much money is in my bank. Right? Not the diplomas on my wall. I'm going to think about the relationships in my life. Right? So as um, he did, well, where was I? Okay. He is a fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated, he ought to sleep the clock around. That was totally me. And then yeah, early in the morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. That was me. <laughs> if he could afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over the house. To be certain, no one gets his entire supply. I'm just laughing because it's so big. Away from to throw down the waste by me. And matters grow worse. He, beca- he begins to use a combination of high power sedatives and liquor to quiet his nerves so he could go to work. Me, I could not function without a drink in me. I was chic unless I drank. I couldn't even eat breakfast unless I had something. Then comes the day, or so combination of high power sedatives and liquor to quiet his nerves who go to work. Then comes the day when he simply cannot make it and he gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor and decides to give him morphine or some sedative which should taper off me. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and sanitariums with detox, right? It says, this is by no means a picture of the true alcohol, as our behavior uh, patterns vary. But this that description, should identify him roughly. We read, we read how it works, right? Go to page 60. <clears throat> we read this every single day, and no one really knows it. It says, the middle page, our description of the alcoholic. Hold on. We just, that's the description. We just read it. The chapter to the agnostic, our personal ventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. The best description or the roughest description is on page 21. I did not know that. I read that shit every day. <laughs> right? Why does he behave like that? Do I behave like that? Make that state, turn that statement and turn it into a question. Do I behave like that? 
This is a self-diagnosis process, guys. Am I an alcoholic or am I an addict or am I both or am I neither? Right? Who are you? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it that he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? What has uh, what has become of his common sense and his willpower and still sometimes displays with all the respects other matters? I have willpower when it comes to gambling. I can't explain that. I can just walk away. But where's my willpower when it comes to drinking? I can't stop. I can't stop. Like the doctor's opinion, like we would rather make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. I'd rather make suicide <laughs> commit suicide. It's like alcoholism is like being active alcohol is like being beaten to death by the cutest, littlest, fluffiest bunny rabbits. <laughs> They're so cute. And they hit you like, oh, that didn't hurt. Why are you kicking me? But they continue to kick me. I'm sleeping. They're still kicking me. I'm starting to bruise. Then I'm starting to bleed everywhere. And I'm bleeding from every hole from my body. That's alcohol. This shit is real, guys. We need an entire psychic change in order to recover, which is a spiritual experience. And that is what is that foundation I talk about, that cement, that common solution that we have. And I'm still standing on this foundation today as I tap this power. Lack of power is not my dilemma anymore. I have power in my life. I had to understand my, what my problem was uh, to get out of jail. So uh, where was I? Perhaps there will never be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcohol reacts like other men. We are equally positive that once uh, he takes alcohol, any alcohol, whatever, to his system, something happens to him both bodily and the mentally sense. Turn that statement, turn into a question. Am I equally positive that I take alcohol and I put it into my system? Something happens to me, bodily and mentally. Yes, something happens, which makes it virtually impossible for me to stop. Is it virtually impossible for me to stop once I put a drink in it? The experience of any alcoholic will, com- will abundantly confirm this. Now, put a line from the confirm this across the page, right? Put a line, shoot. On the the top of that line, put body stops. We are no longer talking about the body anymore. We are going into the mind. On below that mind, put mind begins. I think I'm just going to read one paragraph and stop, I think, right? These observations would be academic, which is academic means important to know, and pointless if our friend never took the first drink. So it's important to know that you have an allergy to the body, that you have a disease of the body, but it is pointless. Because why do we pick up that first drink? Why am I brought to that first drink? How am I brought to this first drink? even though it's killing me. It is literally killing me. I'm like stuck in a body that won't die. (laughs) But I'm also carrying a mind that won't work. And I'm still breathing. That's like literally my definition for (laughs) dudes. I am dudes. I can't stay stopped. Mind, body, and spirit. And it says, therefore... The main problem of the alcohol centers in his mind rather than in his body. Here we go. This is where the fun start, fun things start. A lot of people don't understand that alcohol is not our problem. If alcohol was our problem, then just don't drink would be our solution. (laughs) Right? It's pretty simple. Right. Then the big book would be one page and say, just don't drink and love God. No, it does not say that. <laughs> it's not one page and just says, just don't drink. My mind takes me to that drink. The crux of the problem is centers in my mind. I'll tell you a little story. I got a, 
<clears throat> I went out with my friends in uh, New York City, and I lived in Manhattan at that time, downtown. We go to our favorite spot on 68th Street, 68th uh, <clears throat> Street and uh, Second Ave. And I got pulled over for a DUI. All right. And I got out of the car. They breathalyzed me, made me do a sober test. I failed. Right. <clears throat> and I put my put me in handcuffs, put me in the back of the cop car, see my car get towed, I see my friends watching me get pulled off from the, pulled away in the cop car. I go to one holding cell, stay there for two hours, go to another holding cell, stay there for one hour. Then I go end up in the tombs for three hours. I'm sorry, I'm end up in the tombs for three days, downtown, sleeping on the floor, no lights, I mean, all lights, no darkness, so I can't, I can't sleep. I'm hungover, throwing up in, in jail to get out of jail, and I get on the last train coming back home. I had no money. I had to beg people for money to get on the train to come back up to what, <clears throat> to get it back home. Afterwards, I had to pay a court fee, fines for three years, around $2,000 altogether. I got arrested again one month later. <laughs> you would expect a man, if you were normal, to cut it out and quit. I sincerely told myself I'll never drink and drive again, and I'll never drink again, and I drank again. The main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. I had open heart surgery three months later. didn't even occur to me. I see a bottle. And I took it. I drank it. Picked up right where I left off. The main problem the alcohol centers in his mind rather than in his body. These strange mental blank spots. A lot of people don't understand there's a process to that, right? <clears throat> there's a spiritual separation from any power, right? A spiritual malady, those bedevilments that I was reading in the beginning. I, on my own power, can I make these go away? No. So when I'm in the spiritual separation, all of a sudden I'm making decisions based on self, which puts me in a position to be hurt. And I have this insane thought that comes in. You know, maybe it'd be okay to take a drink. I could. I'm only driving one out, one mile down to the bar. I could drink and drive, no problem. <laughs> right? It's an insane thought. And then I make a decision because of that insane thought, and I take action, and I go drink. And in between that insane thought and that decision is a very small space, but occupies a very, very large God. And I did not tap into that space because I was separated from God. And I took that drink because of the obsession, and then the allergy kicks in, and I'm being kicked to death by bunny rabbits. That's the cycle. I have to stay spiritually fit at all times. A lot of people get confused, or, you know, or get uh, that, um, <clears throat> kind of fall in a trap thinking that God kept them sober. God kept them sober. God could, keeps me. That was true. The big would be one word and four words, one page and four words. God kept me sober. No. It says what we really have is a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of, maintenance of, maintenance of. I'm going to say that one more time. Maintenance of our spiritual condition. That means we got work to do. Work, work, work. Do the work and God works on you. Do the work and God works on you. This is how I stay spiritually fit. This is how I offset the allergy and the obsession. This is how I recovered from that hopeless state of mind and body. It says, if you ask him why he started on that last bend of the chances or he will offer you any one of a hundred alibis. Sometimes these excuses have some certain plausibility, but none of them really make sense in the light of the havoc an alcohol drinking bout creates. They sound like a philosophy. Man, I always laugh at this. Having a headache beats himself on the head with a hammer so he can't feel the ache. Yeah, I got a headache. Beat myself with a hammer. If you, uh, if you draw this fallacious reasoning to the attention of an alcoholic, he will laugh it off or become irritated or refuse to talk. Let's see, I'm out of time. And yet again, honor and privilege to be here, everyone. And hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.